Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, in the room and especially online, to this press conference at the 48th annual meeting at the World Economic Forum. I'm joined today by Senator Corker, Chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, Gary Hugan, uh, CEO of International Justice Mission, Monique Villa, CEO of Thomson Reuters Foundation, and last but not least, John Sedinsky, Vice Chairman of Investors Relation and Business Development at Blackstone. So to get us started, Senator Corker, You've been a champion of this global fund for a long time. Could you share with us the history of its creation and the vision you had for it? Um, sure, I'm glad to be here with these other panelists who've done such an outstanding job in this arena, but uh, there are 40 million people estimated today that live in slavery uh, around the world. Most of them are in about 15 countries. Um, and we became aware of it actually uh, through Gary, who's done so much work in that regard. Uh, someone on our staff heard him speak, our chief of staff who's actually here. Uh, we had him into our office. We began uh, you know, reading materials. We visited a project they had in the Philippines to see the kind of work that they had underway. Became aware of the magnitude of this and uh, just felt like there was a need to have a a global fund to deal with this, much like the world community did with, uh, with HIV uh, through PEPFAR. Um, so we began uh, writing legislation. It took uh, some time to make it happen. We want to, to have something that many, many countries and philanthropists are involved in. We've set something up uh, towards that end, and uh, the United States has made a contribution. The United Kingdom has made a contribution. Other countries will follow. Thank you. Gary. You've, you're, pa this, you're passionate about this topic, but usually this topic is seen as something in the history books. Why do we need this global fund more than ever? Well, I'm grateful for Senator Corker's leadership and the leadership of, the, of uh, Prime Minister Theresa May and the other panelists in addressing this issue, because I think most people would not get the history question correct. Uh, about whether or not there's more people in slavery now than in any other time in history, but that is the fact. There's more people in slavery today than were extracted from Africa uh, over 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. So the thing we just need to know is that the modern slavery problem is still is massive. It's as brutal as it's ever been, but it's more stoppable than it's ever been. Uh, it's illegal everywhere now in the world. It is everywhere in the world, but it's also concentrated itself in a few countries. Um, and so this ought to focus our global efforts. And this is what has been missing. Over the last 20, well, really 10 years, there's been a proliferation of tremendous efforts in raising awareness to trying to address uh, modern day slavery and human trafficking, but they've been completely uncoordinated efforts. And the establishment of a central fund which will not only have the capacity to address the problem on a global scale that actually will be commensurate with the scale of the problem, but it will actually do it with discipline around a coordinated strategy and an accountability as to whether or not all those various efforts are actually being effective in measurably reducing slavery. So this is a game-changing effort in that regard. It really is modeled after the tremendous success of the Global Fund for HIV AIDS, and I think a similar historic transformation can take place in the world. So Gary spoke about strategy. Um, Monique, your foundation has had a lot of initiatives. Why do you think we need um, a cohesive strategy? Well, I mean, the foundation regarding slavery, because we, we, we address uh, other, uh, you know, underreported and very important issues like women's rights and, 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 uh, and human impact of climate change. But slavery is, since uh, 2012, one of the core things at the foundation. And we have started to shed light on the issue through journalism. Uh, so everything that our 48 staff journalists at the foundation write is distributed on the Reuters wise, so it has a global audience. And we have started to, to really shed light on the issues of journalism and journalism uh, of slavery. Slavery is today outlawed in every country in the world. And then, as Gary has said, uh, it's still growing and we have more slaves than ever. So. Uh, 
universally it is abroad and globally it is growing. So there is something that we don't do right. And so we shed light on, on the issue in order that people take interest and then we also take action. So we started by uh, creating a bankers alliance in the US with Cyrus Vance to look at the credit card data, to, to ask the banks to look at the credit card data of their clients and see when there is a pattern of human trafficking. So with the best NGOs in the US, we designed the red flags that they incorporated in their uh, software in order to see when the red flags flash and they can share with law enforcement. And Cyrus said that it, it, it conducted to a lot more uh, suspicious reports from the banks. We did the same bankers alliance in Europe and we are now doing it in Asia. A and the Wolfberg grant, the group of banks, which are the 15 biggest banks in the world, uh, when we launched the European one uh, last uh, uh, May, said to all banks in the world to adopt the toolkit that we were putting uh, outside uh, in order to fight slavery through data because you, if, when you can prove that someone is a slaver through data, you are much stronger than when you only prove it on the strength of the person that has been abused. So that's one. The second one has been to really interest cooperation to the issue because you have 40 million slaves today, according to ILO, probably a lot more. Uh, but data is not right, and we have a big hole there, uh, and we try to, 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 to address also that issue. But on the 14 million slaves, you have 30% in sex trafficking and 70% in, um, in forced labor. So forced labor, it is children. 25% of the slaves in the world are children. Children or adults who work at no pay uh, and are treated as a commodity by uh, corporations. And unfortunately, because the West has outsourced uh, a lot of their production in 40 years ago, without paying enough attention to their supply chain, and what happens down, down, down the supply chain, this has allowed forced labor to flourish. So now, corporation, because the laws were voted uh, in California, in the UK, now in France, soon in Australia, etc., have to pay attention to the issue of the supply chain. And so companies can be a force for good if they really start to uh, pay attention to this issue. And some have really started. So we created two years ago the Stop Slavery Award, which is an Anish Kapoor um, uh, statue that we give to corporations which are best in class to try to clean the supply chain from forced labor. And the first year you had uh, candidates like Apple, like Tesco, like, you know, they have to self-nominate themselves and answer a very long questionnaire. Hewlett Packard won it and NXP Semiconductors, but this year it was consumers brands who won it. And it was Adidas, overall uh, uh, winner. Uh, uh, um, uh, Intel, CNA, retailer. Uh, a co-op in the UK, etc. So more and more consumer brands are really paying attention to the issue and do the right things, which is really important. And finally, we, are going to, we have just launched with Humanity United, which is an NGO which works a lot on, on slavery, uh, the ranking of the 300 biggest companies in the world on what they do for forced labor in order that many who don't feel they have to do something because they are in another country where a law doesn't exist on that, maybe should pay attention. And last, last thing I want to say is that uh, journalism is not dead. Investigative journalism is not dead. Most of the candidates who were candidates for the Stop Slavery Award where um, pay, we're starting to really pay attention to what happens in the supply chain from the moment where media showed that they have a problem either in their production line, like, line, like Apple at some point, or, uh, or in their own supply chain. And then they paid attention and immediately started to fight back on forced labor. So it, it's, it's very interesting that um, media attention can also lead to good things. So, John, Monique talked about the power that business have, that they can be a source of good. As the voice of business on this panel, can you let us know how or even why business get involved in this global fund? 
Thank you. There, there's probably three or four different legs on this table uh, in terms of answering this. Um, first of all, we have the international investor community. Uh, and increasingly, particularly sovereign wealth funds, uh, and particularly the larger ones, not only in the United States, uh, for example, the state of California, but also in the Nordic region, are very focused on ethical investing. So they are very much looking at a broad set of ethical issues. And now with this announcement and with other announcements, we're basically shining a bright light on this whole issue of modern slavery as it relates to supply chain transparency. So it will become an investor issue. Secondly, remember the fish rots from the head. And what that means is corporations have to demonstrate leadership at the chairman and CEO level and at the board level with respect to this important ethical issue. It's a moral issue. And we're, we're living in an age of increasingly moral disorder. And this is the most visible example of where companies around the world in their supply chain are employing people, seemingly employing them. They're not paying them incarcerating them. I can give you lots of examples where on the ground we have filmed slaves in a mine, sent that film to a chairman or chief executive. They denied that was their employees and I subsequently had to prove to them with the video that that was their mine where they were employing people and not paying them. So there is a need in this environment to have corporations in terms of bring the discussion into the boardroom, bring the discussion on the front page of the annual report, bring the discussion to a point where companies develop best practices on how to deal with this issue in their supply chain. The UK has been leadership in this area with the Modern Slavery Act, and there's no question that companies around the world will be able to share best practices with the Global Fund as to what they're doing to remove modern slavery from their supply chain. This will take a long time. This is not something that's going to be solved in one or two years, but we need to get going. And lastly, I would say, given we're in the age of social media, investors have power Boards now need to take responsibility among their stakeholders, but ultimately the consumer particularly has power in this age of social media to be much more assertive with their companies as to how they feel about brands that are not taking this issue seriously. So I applaud the Global Fund, and I, I know the Global Fund will become a, an important partner um, and companies will become partners of the Global Fund, both financially and in terms of sharing best practices, as well as how they plan to eliminate modern slavery from their own supply chain over the next decade. Thank you. Before I open the floor for any questions, I'd like to provide you all an opportunity to add to any of the comments made by your fellow panelists. I would just add uh, to, to the comments that were made to, to look at this um, and to try to deal with it in a manner that you measure the results, um, I think is very important. Um, so much, uh, we, we see so many efforts where that is not the case. I know as a as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, for instance, uh, as it related to dealing with HIV around the world, we had to really focus on making sure that we looked at uh, cases and the amount of treatments that were taking place, and we didn't lose sight of what our goal was. And so the same is true here. And so uh, one of the things for those people who might be investing in these kind of things, whether it's the United Kingdom or the United States, uh, which, by the way, there is a 501c3 set up, much like the uh, National Endowment for Democracy, that will have board members from all around the world that will be leading this effort. 
but to make sure that that investment is yielding results is very, very important. And so, as Gary mentioned, there's metrics uh, going in and figuring out how much slavery is actually occurring in a place before you begin, and then showing that you're actually deriving results. Uh, so this will be an effort. Again, it's a true public-private partnership. Uh, led currently by two countries, uh, other countries will follow, we'll have private sector involvement, uh, and we really want to leverage our funds and build momentum around, again, achieving results. So um, I'm indebted to the people here involved that have been, and by the, let me mention one other thing, there, there, you come here to the World Economic Forum, and you realize there are efforts that are taking place that are not coordinated. Uh, people are not necessarily taking advantage of the best practices that another organization may have in place. I mean, just sitting here listening to the panelists, you can see that they're involved in differing ways. But to be able to have an entity that's using those best practices and helping others uh, do the same, uh, I think it will be very, very important in achieving the goal we've all set, set out to accomplish. Just following on what Senator Corker has shared, this is the game-changing development over just the last five or six years, as we've now developed tools by which you can actually draw prevalence levels of forced labor and slavery, sex trafficking, within a jurisdiction. Imagine, as the Senator mentioned, to try to fight HIV AIDS if you didn't know how much there was, and whether or not various interventions were actually reducing the, the, the prevalence level. This is now possible. So it's no longer an excuse to say, well, this, we, we just don't know what works and what does not. There are means by which we can actually um, test and measure what's working. And so now it will be about investing in those methodologies that are proven to be effective. The second game changer here is that the, uh, the commercial sector has a huge influence on addressing the utter impunity that exists in many of the emerging market countries in terms of forced labor, where the laws are there but just simply not enforced. And now, the corporate sector can step up and say, we love helping uh, grow the economy here, but we're facing tremendous reputational exposure from the possibility of forced labor in our supply chain. And to go to those governments and to say, it would be indispensable to us if you, the local government, would actually enforce your laws against slavery so we're not swimming in this ocean of impunity. When corporations start to begin to raise their voice in that way, we are finding that these are the voices that the uh, local authorities, especially in emerging market countries, care about the most. And so this is also going to be a, a game-changing uh, role that the private sector is going to have in this fight. Yeah, if, if I just can add to all that, is that it, it, the real impact uh, uh, comes really from the cross-sector collaboration. You know, uh, when, when companies started to, to fight slavery in the cocoa industry in, in, um, in Ivory Coast, they, they joined forces together to, to, to address the issue. When now we, we, we corporations try to address the issue, of slavery in the fishing industry in Thailand or in the Philippines. And they work together uh, to, to, to address the issue because alone a corporation cannot do a lot. So when you have this, uh, this uh, cross-sector collaboration and shared expertise, that, uh, as you say, with business, with government, and with civil society working together, then you have really a force. And this is what we, we start to see coming. And this is what we, we, I think we all around this table, and I know Jean Baden Schneider uh, at the Global Fund, really try to push this collaboration without which nothing will happen. And, and all the laws that are voted are very good. They don't have a lot of teeth at this stage because it's just a question of declaring what you do uh, to address the issue of forced labor. But one day they may have teeth and then, you know, corporation will really have to address the issue. So collaboration for much bigger impact is crucial. I think the other thing that's worth saying, because this is not a, a simple problem, there are really three big legs on a very big table, which is the whole issue of prevention, which is a very big discussion, the issue of rescuing, and then thirdly, the, the issue of rehabilitating survivors. And all three of these are in itself three separate, very deep and broad areas which you have to remember. There are lots of examples around the world where, from a poverty point of view, if you can deal with job creation locally and deal with poverty locally, 
the likelihood of that you're going to have a high f focus of preventing trafficking is, is very likely. Um, the issue of rescuing and moreover the issue of rehabilitation of survivors is very important and there's a lot more work to be done on this. Thank you. I'm now going to open the floor for one or two questions, if we have any. Please state your name and your organization. Ruben Moyman for the newspaper De Standaard in Brussels in Belgium. Um, how much money is being invested in the fund by whom and how will it be spent? Um, the goal is to raise uh, $1.5 billion. And thus far, the United Kingdom has put uh, 25 million in. The United States has put 25 million in. We'd like to to leverage uh, an overall investment by the United States over a seven-year period of 250 million, with 500 million coming from from other countries, and then have that matched with 750. Excuse me, it's a 1.25 million dollar, 1.5 million billion dollar investment. We'd like to have the, the 250 uh, matched with 500 coming from other countries and 750 million coming from the private sector. And so this, in the areas that the fund works, in the areas that the fund allocates money, what we'd like to see happen is a 50 percent reduction in slavery in those areas to prove that what we're doing is effective and shows results and then grow the fund from there. That it's a problem of, of, of jurisdictions, of laws not being uh, uh, properly uh, executed. Yeah. Uh, so how are you going to do that? Yeah, so I'll let Gary speak more fully to this, but uh, going in and working with lo local law enforcement, uh, working with prosecutors, uh, changing the culture of the police department themselves, making sure that uh, that on the back end, after victims have been rescued, there's there's a there, there's a, a safety net to allow them to come back into society in a real way, but it takes resources to do that. It takes teams of people uh, going into these countries. Uh, again, in every country in the world, slavery is against the law. But going in and causing, uh, we saw, for instance, I won't mention which jurisdiction, but we saw where just a, a few policemen at the top of a particular department uh, changing the way they went about dealing with this changed the entire department. Because before that, uh, you can imagine the corruption, the graft that was taking place to allow, to cause people to turn their heads away from this uh, blight on society. A few, years, a few years ago, the uh, Gates Foundation invested $5 million in a project to try to reduce child sex trafficking in the city of Cebu in the Philippines, and the goal was to have that reduced by 20 percent uh, over that five-year period of time. IJM partnered with them in standing up local law enforcement to address this, and when the outside auditors came back to measure the effectiveness of that, they found a 79 percent reduction in child sex trafficking. That was then replicated in the city of Manila and in the city of Pampanga in the Philippines, and they produced 76 and 86 percent reductions in child sex trafficking. So it shows it's actually possible to invest in building local capacity to bring great effective law enforcement and great survivor services, and you can now measure the way slavery collapses when there's the risk of actually going to jail for it and when survivors believe they actually have a future. This is the vaccine that actually exists in the world now for getting rid of slavery, but like all other sort of global efforts, it's going to take resources commensurate to the problem. As the senator pointed out, it's a $150 billion profit annually, according to the ILO, and it seems rather modest for the world to pony up $1.5 billion to take on that fight. And if I may add, one of the big, big difficulties in the fight against trafficking is the lack of prosecution. It's the total impunity that slavers enjoy all around the world. So we fight a very organized crime in a pretty disorganized manner. So the Global Fund and whatever uh, means can be given to justice around the world, etc., will be important. But we have to realize that, you know, Slavery exists only because of corruption. 
Corruption is degrees of slavery everywhere at every level from the policeman or the policewoman uh, that, you, that you pay to, to, to judges which are not doing their job, etc. Corruption is the big issue behind this very organized crime. So it will not be that simple, but it's true that to have means instead of not having no means in the fight will change things, obviously. So... Oh. We have one more question. Yes, um, I'm actually from the World Economic Forum, Georg Schmidt, sorry. Um, Mr. Sosinski, you mentioned social media as a way for consumers to, to pressure private sector players to, to, to hold up the standards. I'd like to hear from you, but also from the other panelists, what role technology can play in this, in this fight against slavery? Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I had lunch today with a, um, a very prominent um, fashion designer. And um, this is someone who's an activist, and this is someone who's very interested in the subject. And this person said to me categorically, there's no question that people buying their brands will ask the question very soon, is there slavery in this garment? It's not a question of whether it's made in China or the United States or in the UK, or whether it's made out of cotton, linen, silk, or rayon. The issue is, has a modern slave made this garment? And one of the things I often say, and I've often int introduced the term ethical profit, which is we should be interested in profit that's been entirely ethically uh, arrived at rather than the maximized profit. And the ethical profit is a profit which is someone can look their consumer straight in the face and say, we understand our supply chain and there are no slaves that manufactured this uh, t-shirt. And consumers can text, they can put things on Twitter, and they can, when they, when they come across a brand that they think has dubious origins, uh, and I often think something that is very inexpensive has to be challenged. Uh, I don't want to make any generalizations, that's unfair. But something that's very inexpensive, you have to challenge uh, the origins of it, where it's made, how it's made, and w the supply chain. And, and if a company actually says to you, well, we don't entirely know all aspects of our supply chain, that's not sufficient. Companies have got to take full responsibility for every aspect of their supply chain. Otherwise, the consumer has a right to raise a lot of questions. Yeah. On that issue, because this is something that we want to address with the Stop Slavery Award, because indeed you receive an award because you have done the right things to try to, to eradicate forced labor from your supply chain. But you will notice that the big consumers brand that received this award this year have not made big campaign on that. And the, 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 the thing is that the mentality are not yet ready and it's a very interesting discussion where consumers should have a role to play, and I hope they will play it. It doesn't seem that uh, companies are ready to, to advertise on the fact that they have clean supply chain because they think that, you know, maybe the consumer uh, doesn't want to feel guilty when he buys something. So, I mean, this notion of the consumer feeling guilty is quite interesting to think of. And quite interesting to push because I think that consumer would feel guilty if they knew that they were slaves in the supply chain, but would certainly feel much better if they knew that in this brand there is no slaves and, and, and it's clean. So it's an interesting discussion that will be the one in the, in the next months and years. And social media and technology can play a role. One of the things that's quite amusing is a number of chief executives in the last 12 months, a lot to do with as a result of the work that Jean has done, Monique has done, and other sort of activists in this area. A lot of chief executives have said, well, we actually believe we don't have any slavery in our supply chain. And of course, as you know, today, that is a red flag to the media, and the media will go out of their way to try to prove them wrong. And I would say now, every chief executive who's said this is not an issue for us has regretted it. Some of them have been publicly embarrassed yeah. because they have had to pull in their tail and say, whoops, we actually went a little too far in this statement. So 
what we're now seeing, certainly in the UK, under the Modern Slavery Act, is everyone is very cautious, wants to do their homework, wants to understand all aspects of their supply chain before they go too far. And I think most people know they have slavery somewhere in their supply chain. It's a question of how to deal with it proactively and being very candid about how transparent they can be and focus on, it's almost like asking a company to reinstate their their values and their, their set of ethics in terms of how they actually do their business, how they do their core business. Yeah. So on that statement, I would like to thank my panelists uh, for taking the time to explain this important issue and discussing the ways that it can be resolved and that there is an optimistic option for that and that we should be galvanized to join that cause. And I would like to thank everyone in the room and online. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.